TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. Jerusalem is prepared for any scenario and will cause Lebanon to shiver if Hezbollah would force Israel into war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a long overdue phone conversation with U.S. President Joe Biden last night, the first such conversation almost a full month after the latter assumed office. The Islamic Republic of Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei emphasizes that his country was not interested in words but rather demands action in all that pertains to the 2015 nuclear agreement. Israel is prepared for any scenario and will cause Lebanon to shiver if Hezbollah would force the IDF into war. Speaking at a memorial ceremony for Israel's fallen soldiers, whose place of burial remains unknown today, Jerusalem's top defense official responded to threats made by Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah a day prior. Defense Minister Benny Gunn stressed that while days of battle may pose a challenge to Israel's civilian communities at the home front, those challenges will be meager compared to the terrible devastation that Hezbollah and Lebanon will face in days of battle with Israel. <laughs> במחירי המלחמה או בעיני קרב. ואכן, אם יהיו ימי קרב בחזיתות השונות, הם יהיו קשים לעורף הישראלי, אך הם יהיו קשים ונוראים קודם כל עבור אויבינו. הדבר הזה נכון במיוחד לחיזבאללה וגם לחמאס, שפועלים לבניית יכולות התקפיות מתוך אוכלוסייה אזרחית. ומבצעים בכך פשע מלחמה. מול האיום הזה צהל ארוך לכל הפעלת כוח שתידרש. אם נצטרך להגיע לעמי קרב בלבנון, לבנון תרעד, וחיזבאללה ייפגע אנושות. The threat leveled by Minister Gantz was made in direct response to Nasrallah's own threat, in which he asserted, quote, Israel's home front needs to know that if there is a war with Hezbollah, it will see things it has not yet seen since the establishment of Israel. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu held a long-stalled phone conversation with U.S. President Joe Biden last night, a first such conversation almost a full month after the latter assumed office. According to separate statements issued by the White House and the Prime Minister's office respectively, the discussion between the two leaders lasted for about an hour, during which the importance of cooperating on regional issues, including Iran, received center stage. Furthermore, both leaders underscored their intention to work together to continue strengthening the steadfast alliance between Israel and the United States, while President Biden had also confirmed his long-lasting personal commitment to Israel's security. In related news, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, revealed that Israel will always prefer a diplomatic solution if it is real and can actually block Iran's path to nuclear capability. In an interview to Israel's army radio, Ambassador Erdan was asked whether this policy was similar to that of Jerusalem prior to the 2015 nuclear agreement with Iran, to which he responded, quote, not at all. He explained that in contrast to the 2015 deal, which was formulated under the Obama administration, quote, today many countries have a clear understanding, and that is why an effort is being made to cooperate on the matter. Meanwhile, in Tehran, the Islamic Republic's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei emphasized that his country was not interested in words, but rather demands action. After Iranian President Hassan Rouhani received a phone call from German Chancellor Angela Merkel, in which she stressed Berlin's concerns over Tehran's non-compliance under the JCPOA and emphasized her hopes to see the Islamic Republic return into compliance, Ayatollah Khamenei emphasized in a private address to his followers that only if actions are taken by the other side, 
In reference, of course, to the United States lifting its sanctions, the Ayatollah regime will act accordingly. In response to the unwavering position voiced by Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the ultimate decision maker for the Islamic Republic, International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi is scheduled to visit Tehran on Saturday to try and foster an agreement, allowing the continuation of the agency's inspections and verification activities in the country, regardless of political developments. It is important to explain that according to Iranian legislation, the Islamic Republic is expected to thwart IAEA inspectors from receiving access to its nuclear program by the 21st of February. Nevertheless, the United States is seemingly unimpressed by this law, which is regarded as a hollow threat. Uh, of course, we are aware of Iran's threat to uh, cease the provisional application of its additional protocol uh, obligations, as well as other inspections provided for under the 2015 deal, the JCPOA. Um, this, of course, comes on top of uh, other steps Iran has taken that uh, exceed, uh, go beyond uh, what the JCPOA uh, allows uh, in terms of limits on uh, its nuclear um, programs. Uh, the good news, of course, that all, is that all of these steps uh, are reversible uh, and the path for diplomacy uh, remains open. Uh, and I would say that as, as we and our partners uh, have underscored, uh, Iran should reverse these steps and refrain from taking others. Uh, that would impact um, the IAEA assurances on which not only the United States, uh, not only our allies and partners uh, in the region, uh, but the entire world uh, relies. Uh, Iran should provide full and timely cooperation with the IAEA. Um, Price went on to highlight Washington's position, which is left unchanged. Um, of course, uh, the proposition that you have heard from this podium, that you have heard from the President of the United States, that you have heard from Secretary Blinken, uh, it of course remains on the table. Uh, if Iran resumes its full compliance uh, with the deal, um, we will uh, do the same. Importantly, um, as you have also heard us say, um, that the deal for us, um, it is a floor, it's not a ceiling. Um, and we want to go beyond uh, the 2015 deal, uh, lengthen and strengthen uh, it, and uh, build on it with follow-on uh, arrangements to address other areas of uh, concern when it comes to our relationship with Iran and concern that our allies and partners share, including Iran's uh, ballistic missile program. Turning to Turkey, where special police forces detained a female member of the Islamic State and her two little children who were trying to illegally cross into Turkey from Syria earlier this week. And while this type of illegal infiltrations is somewhat of a common occurrence, Attempted by members of the Islamic State after the terror organization's relative defeat, the referred to female held in her possession passports from both New Zealand and Australia. Consequently, Ankara authorities made contact with their counterparts in both Wellington and Canberra. Yet after it has been revealed that the latter revoked the terrorist citizenship, Turkish authorities said they would opt to extradite the woman and her children to New Zealand, a fact which naturally infuriated Wellington authorities. Our very strong view on behalf of New Zealand and New Zealanders was that this individual was clearly most appropriately dealt with by Australia. That is where their family resides, that is where their links reside, and that is the place from which they departed for Syria. I raised that issue directly with PM Morrison and asked that we work together on resolving the issue. I was then informed in the following year that Australia had unilaterally revoked the citizenship of the individual involved. You can imagine my response. Since that time, we have continually raised with Australia our view that their decision was wrong. We continue to raise that view. My concern, however, now is that we have a situation where someone is now detained with two small children. My focus is on resolving this interest issue with the best interests of the children in mind, whilst continuing to making very strong representations to Australia about their responsibility here. In response to the Prime Minister of New Zealand, her Australian counterpart rejected her rebuke, 
highlighting that first and foremost he must put Australia's national security interests at the top of his priorities. Well, my job is Australia's interests. That's my job. And it's, it's, it's my job as, a, as, a, as the Australian Prime Minister to put Australia's national security interests first. So I think all Australians would agree with that. Now, the legislation that was passed through our parliament automatically cancels the citizenship of a dual citizen where they've been engaged in terrorist activities of this nature. Uh, and that happens automatically. And that has been a known part of Australia's law for some time. Now, I understand that the New Zealand government has, has uh, some issues with that. Australia's interest here is that we do not want to see terrorists who fought with terrorism organisations enjoying privileges of citizenship, which I think they forfeit, the second they gauge as an enemy of our country. And I think Australians would agree with that. Thank you for watching us. As part of TV7's prayer initiative, I would like to encourage you today to join myself and the team here in Jerusalem to lift up Finland once again in prayer for its salvation and peace, alongside prayers for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, in addition to our ongoing prayers, of course, for the peace of Jerusalem, the salvation of Israel, and for all those who are impacted by the corona contagion and its numerous ramifications worldwide. Separately, I would like to also thank all of you who partner with TV7 Israel. Your dedicated monthly support, both by means of finance and prayer, is of crucial importance for our ongoing operations. I'm Jonathan Hassan, wishing you an Erev Tovu Mevorach, and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.